so after sand deep, uh, I was trying to practice my empathy, not with incontinence, but um, I'm starving looking at that menu. Oh my goodness. <laughs> anyway, do me a favor, raise your hands if you've ever been to Seattle. No, dude, not like this, man. It's not a concert. <laughs> Seattle, that's where I'm from. That's where I live. That's where I work. The skies there are filled with these huge rain clouds. They're like never-ending sprinklers. On your raincoat, if you don't have a hood, you are going to get soaked. And if you're the person walking around with an umbrella, yeah, you are the tourist. <laughs> so on one of these sleepless in Seattle days, I was trudging uphill both ways to get back to work. I was running late for a staff meeting. So as I'm walking up to our building, I see some police cars. Now some alerts went off in my head. I was like, uh-oh, something's wrong at work. But as I turned the corner and walked in our front door, there was nothing remarkable going on. So I thought to myself, that's weird. But I was really running late for the staff meeting, so that's where my head was at. I had to get there. So as I walked into our staff meeting, like one minute before two, my buddy Purvis is there. Purvis is a man with a smile as wide as he is tall. He's got such infectious energy. All you ever do is want to give him a hug. But he's like, dude, stay away from me. <laughs> so Purvis is talking to our staff about equity and social justice. So he always leads off with an equity and social justice moment. He starts talking to the staff about moments before he was walking across the street to come into our building. He was talking about his experience coming across police cars. It was so markedly different than mine. He starts going through his pockets. He's like, do I got my ID on me? He starts going through this mental checklist in his head. Where was I? What was I doing before I came to work? Just keep my cool. I was doing nothing wrong. And it just occurred to me that Purvis and I had two radically different experiences in the same exact situation. So Purvis finished up this talk, and he went to leave. And I stopped him, and I thanked him for sharing that personal experience with our whole staff. I shared with him my experience as a white man and how totally different that was from his. He stopped me and then said thank you. That, my friends, is when I got my big old hug from Purvis. <laughs> the late author Wayne Dyer said, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And that couldn't be more true in the work that we do around substance use disorder and the idea of supervised injection spaces. For the idea on the surface of giving somebody with opiate use disorder a clean, safe, hygienic, stigma-free place to use their drugs, on the surface, it might not make much sense. Until that is, you look at things from their perspective. I'll never forget in 2014 when I first came to Seattle. We were experiencing an all-time high in drug overdose deaths. I mean, I remember that bar chart, the one that got bigger and bigger and bigger until that last bar, it looked like it was about to fall over. And yes, that's me sitting at the end of the table <laughs> before I could grow a beard. I mean, we knew we had work to do. We had to provide more treatment options for people. We couldn't ask people to trudge from one side of town all the way to the other side of town every single day to get help. We knew we had a lot of work to do around the way that the public saw prescription drugs and pain. Pain could no longer be viewed as the fifth vital sign. Walking into a doctor's office and seeing a painometer that goes from zero to 10 with smiley faces all the way to frowny faces and treating two days of acute pain with 10 days of prescription narcotics, that could cause a lifetime of problems. 
According to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, four out of every five people, 80% of people who start using heroin, start with inappropriate use of pain medication. But we also knew that we had some other work to do. How could we help the most vulnerable people? I've been working in this field for 20 years. Do you know these people who have been knocking at the door of our substance use facilities, saying, I need help, but because their UA is positive for some drugs or they were 10 minutes late for their appointment, we say, I'm sorry, not today. You can't come in. You didn't follow the rules. Those people, left to their own vices, have no other choice but to go to an alleyway or a public bathroom, leaving the orange caps from their needles a stone's throw away from an exposed syringe. Last December in Seattle, there were over 700 needles collected in one month alone. It's rare today. I'm sorry, I cry. It's okay. I've given myself permission. It's rare today that I go out in the community to talk to somebody about the opiate epidemic when they don't know somebody who's been touched. It could be a parent, themselves, a grandparent, or maybe even a sibling. This is my brother, Greg. Greg had this round face and had this shit in grin to let you know how much he loved life. We were always there to support each other. He'd be sitting right there right now. Actually, I'm sort of glad he's not, because he'd have me cracking up right now. <laughs> or maybe I wish he was. Greg went to the Michigan State University. Go white. Go white. He was a philosophy major there. He loved talking about Aristotle and Plato and good old Detroit Coney dogs with onions and mustard on them. Ugh, nasty. I mean, I'll never forget the day he died. That phone call from my dad. The voice of a man who knew his life had changed forever. A couple weeks later, we got the death certificate. It said died of a drug overdose. But almost 14 years later, I've done a lot of thinking. And the truth is, I don't think he died of a drug overdose. I think my brother died because of the silence of stigma. The same silence that's killing so many people today. I mean, it reads like a who's who of Americana, Prince, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Heath Ledger, and one of our most recent, Tom Petty. I mean, speaking of Americana, and Linda stole my stat this morning, more people died of a drug overdose in 2016 than in the Iraq and Vietnam War combined. This is Insight in Vancouver, BC. Where I live in Seattle, it's our closest supervised consumption neighbor. I mean, I'll never forget the first time I went there. What I saw there was earth shattering. At least it was to me. It was peers and professionals treating people with respect and dignity and compassion who were about to get high. I mean, I'll never forget seeing this dude. He was sitting there, he couldn't even stay in his own skin. He was fidgeting and twitching. Somebody walked up to him, put his hand on his shoulder, and said, can I get you some help? Is now the time? The dude couldn't even talk. All he did was shake his head up and down. And together, the two of them walked all the way over to, like, 100 feet, to an elevator, and got this fella into treatment. It might have possibly saved his life that day. But it was, whether it did or didn't, it was a much better life trajectory for that gentleman than nobody there to say, I care. So in Seattle, we've called these 
supervised consumption sites, CHELs, or community health engagement locations. These are not the panacea for the opiate epidemic. It's just one intervention for the most marginalized people. We decided to call these sites CHEL sites because as time went on, it became more and more clear that what we were trying to do was so much more than just keep people alive. But what we were really trying to do is engage them in health services. We know people with behavioral health conditions die an average of 25 years earlier than those folks that don't have behavioral health conditions. At the King County Needle Exchange, we know that 80% of the people that come to the Needle Exchange would use a supervised consumption space. After all, they come in, they get their clean needles and everything they need so that there's no disease transmission or other types of complications like endocarditis or all these negative health outcomes. And then at their very most vulnerable moment, we say, I'm sorry, but you see that clean, sterile, hygienic table over there? You can't use that for your drugs. Your best bet is probably to go outside, go around the corner, and that dirty, rat-infested alleyway in back, you can use that. If you want some privacy, go on behind a garbage dump. Oh, and oh, by the way, don't use a loan. Because half the people in the King County Needle Exchange are homeless. They truly have nowhere else to go. Insight is just one of over 100 of these facilities worldwide. They've been operating for over 30 plus years. When Insight opened, they experienced a 30 to 50% increase in treatment admissions and detox admissions after they opened. In an area four football fields wide surrounding the facility, in the four years after they opened up, there was a decrease in overdose deaths of 35%. That's compared to 9% in the rest of the city. From Australia to Vancouver, BC, these sites have been so well researched. We know that after these sites open up, there's no increase in violent crime or crimes against people. And actually, there's been a decrease in property crime. There's amazing pictures. In Europe, after a supervised consumption space opened nearby, of reclaimed green spaces that had formerly been taken over, although I hate that word, by public injection and needles laying around. This is my friend Thea. Now, I'm gonna look right in the camera because I know my wife is gonna be watching this one day and I want it very clear that I'm not talking about our old cat, Althea. <laughs> because to the best of my knowledge, Althea, honey, never had a drug problem, but she purred like none other for some catnip, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so Thea, when she was hired at the Downtown Needle Exchange, her staff were elated because Thea used to walk in the clear glass doors of the needle exchange to get her clean needles there. I mean, she, was a nat she is a natural for this work. She's just got that warm presence that makes people feel so valued. She gets that across without even saying a word. So Thea and I often have the opportunity to do public education in the community around the opiate epidemic. So I'll never forget, we were at one of those fancy schmancy hotels in downtown Seattle, sort of like this one. Floors upon floors of climbing escalators and beautiful chandeliers suspended in midair. As we got off at the sixth floor, it was almost like Thea went back in a time capsule. She was frozen. I looked at her and I was like, Thea, you okay? She didn't say a word. All she did was point down the hall. I looked down the hall and all I could see was a men's sign and a woman's sign. She's like, you see down there? And I'm like, yeah, you need to go to the bathroom? She's like, no, that's where I overdosed. That's where I almost died. Because if Seattle is anything like where you live, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of unsupervised consumption spaces all over the city. From Philadelphia to Baltimore to Seattle, 
cities around the country are considering supervised consumption spaces to help with their overdose problem. In Philadelphia, they believe they can save up to 76 people's lives a year. Now I know these are theoretic lives because the truth of the matter is there's no supervised consumption spaces in this country that we know about above ground. <laughs> but what is not theoretic and is 100% true is that people are dying every single day. In Seattle, one person dies a day of a drug overdose. And those, the majority of those folks are opiate related. In 2016, there were 64,000 people that died of a drug overdose. If you line every single person up who died of a drug overdose, it would make a line 70 miles long. That's from here to Baltimore and almost all the way back again. What else is real, true, and not theoretic is the number of people that have died worldwide in the 30 plus years of supervised consumption of an overdose at a facility. Zero. Not a single person has ever died of an overdose. A couple months ago, I was at an opiate overdose surveillance meeting. It's one of those meetings where a bunch of agencies come together to talk about the drug epidemic and people dying and all that type of stuff. And there are a bunch of Seattle police officers there. The Seattle police officers, like it or not, are one of our first lines of defense in a, this social service responsibility that we have to the community. They were one of the first in our area, one of the first law enforcement groups to carry Narcan, the opiate overdose medication. Now, when you walk into a meeting and you see a bunch of police, and some of them are in uniform and some are not, you always know the ones not in uniform. So you all know because they're usually stone cold face and often they have a mustache. <laughs> Ironically, I went back to the same meeting last week and they all had beards. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> when the former Surgeon General Vivek Murthy was in town, he went on a bike riding tour with the Seattle Police Department. Now, if you wanna see something amazing, the Surgeon General is out there riding bike with the police officers I mean, in all his suit, pins, and patches, just like he walked off the stage last year at NatCon. So the police officers were telling this story about they were out riding around and on patrol, and they saw this blanket that was covering up a sidewalk. They thought that was sort of weird, although weird things happen on the streets of Seattle, so they thought they should take a look into it. There was nobody around, so they decided it was probably best to see what was underneath. Underneath was an exposed manhole. So they thought we should continue to investigate. So they descended the earth in this manhole. And what they realized was people were living down there. It was filled with needles and squalor. Because you see, people don't want to die. They just don't want to be sick. They thought that was a safe place, a place where they could go where they weren't going to be judged and somebody could watch them to make sure that they don't die. These are the folks that these chow sites are made for. People that just by the presence of their substance use disorder alone makes them more vulnerable for negative health outcomes and death. These people might not be ready to stop using drugs because of the trauma the urges or the cravings, but they're still our responsibility. Because if we don't take care of them, it'll be the medical examiner. And they'll be the next one the medical examiner puts in line, but not from here to Baltimore, but from here to Philadelphia, or maybe all the way to Detroit. So just remember that big old warm hug I got from Purvis, and 
that amazing feeling you get from putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. We know that we might not have all the answers to the opiate epidemic, but what we do have are interventions that we know work. So when you go home, have a conversation. Talk about the facts and the logic that we talked about here today, and then repeat it again. I mean, that's what I did. I remember walking into my house, looking at my wife, and her going, safe injection facilities? Hell no. Or my best friend Ted sitting across from me at dinner, putting his fist on the table, being like, all right, explain this to me now. By having those conversations, you can reduce stigma. And by reducing stigma, you can save somebody's life. Because people don't hit rock bottom. They die. So just remember what our good old friend Wayne Dyer said. If we want to change the problem, we need to change the way we look at the problem. Thank you. <laughs>